Um, so thank you, firstly, very much for having me here. We're very honoured, um, and I'm very sorry that Mike can't join me because we work very, very closely together. So it's a real shame he's not here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our projects. We work in Africa, which is very unusual. Um, so I'm going to talk through quite a few projects. I know you were worried that I'm showing so many projects, but I think it's nice to give a broad range of where we work and how we work. Um, so I'll start. Um, this one I'm going to discuss about is landscape architecture and design within East, East, East Africa, specifically. Um, I want to show our studio locations. Our main studio is in Nairobi, in Kenya, within East Africa, and that's been the place where most of our projects have happened, and that's what I'll show you. And we're just opening an office now in southern France. Um, and our main idea from the office in France is to really start working in North and West Africa, and as well as Europe. I'm really excited to try and start working within Europe. Um, this is our team. <laughs> very happy team. Um, here's Michael and I, who are the main directors, and then we have, at one time, sort of two architects who work with us. Um, at the moment, it's Margarita and Jordan, but I've listed there also our past, past people who work for us. Um, so this to show you, I think it's just important to really identify where we work on the map in the world. Um, so Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda are currently the countries we're currently working in. Um, I'm going to discuss first some commercial projects and public spaces. What's really interesting within Africa is there, there are no, or within African cities, there are no public spaces, or very few. The few parks that are in Nairobi were designated by the British. Um, so there's two parks, and the rest, there's nothing. So what we're seeing is happening is that commercial entities, um, this is a mall, I never thought I'd ever do a mall, uh, seeing that there's a commercial benefit in providing exterior public space for the population. Um, this, is, this is the Sarit Center, it's one of the oldest malls in the middle of Nairobi, so it's very, very hectic, it's crazy. Um, and we're doing three sort of landscape areas, but I'm just gonna talk about the roof garden at the moment. Our concept for this was very, very, very simple, just to provide simple ele elements, be it shade, so our whole concept in the plan uh, is really just planting a forest on a roof. We're planting 200 trees on this roof garden. So from a technical point of view, it's, it's very technical. And we've got a very good consultant team with engineers from South Africa and the like. Um, the shape of the roof garden was determined by the architecture. It's very, very strange. So I think our design with it was trying to simplify the space. So we just have a line of water and a series of trees which are broken up to make space for, for different uses. Um, but you see just a simple line of water. This is another project, again, a shopping center, um, which is really interesting. This, this project, they decided to designate 30 car parking spaces into a public courtyard, which we found amazing, because that never, never, ever happens within Africa, where they're so generous with their space. But again, it's purely for the commercial side of it, of the draw of bringing more people to their mall. Um, this is a plan. I think what's really interesting, if I can show the red, is all the way out, outside basically is a car park. It's really horrible. And the main thing for us was to design very high walls to block out the noise which happens outside and to provide a very sort of calming space for people within the mall. Um, what's another thing which is really interesting is um, there's a lot of security issues within East Africa. One of the key issues with this project was working with a security team to make these walls bomb-proof, which is very, very interesting, the actual detail of it. It's basically two very simple masonry block walls and the inside of the walls are filled with soil. Um, so it absorbs on impact. It's very interesting. You would never think you would actually have to design for a bomb-proof courtyard. But there we go. Um, this is something I just really want to show is how, how we like to work, which is if we come across something in nature, we make space for that element to breathe. So you can see the branch of this tree was coming into the line of the wall, and we just simply made a space within the wall. Um, to allow for that for ha to happen. This decision was made on site because the detail of the plans and the surveys that we get are very bad in Africa. Um, so yeah, we had to make the decision on site, but I think it's beautiful and gives a, a, a nice sort of introduction to the courtyard from the outside. Um, this is the courtyard from the inside. Um, 
you can see our trees are absolutely tiny. That's something I'll talk about further in the presentation. Um, but I think what's nice here is, is how we've introduced the idea of kids' play in a very simple way and in a way which isn't obvious where the children are supposed to play. These benches at the front are timber benches and they move, so it's almost like a seesaw bench. It's very beautiful, the children sort of jump on one end and it falls down and then they run up and they jump off the other. So it's very beautiful how they interact. And again, again, our swings, which is more of a chair, um, trying to sort of quieten everything down because the East African cities are crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, and just another image to look at the lineal element. I mean, there was a lot of things in the design of the pavement, sort of directional design, um, drawing people into the mall, which is, of course, what the client wants. Um, just a few images. Um, we like working, I love stone, which you'll see through this um, presentation. And um, these are waste bits of granite um, that we brought in as bollards. But again, it's really nice for the kids. They sort of jump from one to one. Um, so yeah, it's a nice project. This is in response to that. This is a self-created project which has come out of a need of understanding that there's no public space within the cities. Um, and within, within Nairobi, basically, the only public spaces are the streets. And so we really sort of wanted to explore how, how can we try and improve these. Um, it's in its, in its very early stages, and we're hoping to sort of get people like you and Habitat and things like that on board, so we can really basically develop a booklet of how um, different parts of Nairobi can improve their street in a very cost-effective and simple way. Um, what we did is pick out four study areas within Nairobi. I'm just going to talk about one, which is Kibera, which is one of the most famous slums. You can see this is a density um, plan, and you can see where, where the arrow is saying Kibera. It's very, very, very dense, the population at that point. <clears throat> but our main choice in choosing these four regions was really trying to understand, um, basically, the elevation drop within Nairobi, which goes from... Ooh, sorry, it goes from very, very high to very, very low. And so basically the, the trees and the vegetation in each of the different areas in Nairobi is very, very, very different. Um, this is an image of Kibera, just to give you an idea of, of the street and what does the street actually mean. There's a, a railway that runs the right railway through the middle, which fortunately does not work at the moment, but you can just see the issues of safety, um, water, the idea, issues sort of how do you deal with waste removal, it's, it's quite something, and it's a big feat to try and think how you could potentially improve this. Um, now, Kibera is a part of Nairobi which um, is, comes from the word Kibra, which actually means forest in Nubian, and it gives you an indication of what this used to be. It used to be basically a dryland forest, um, Kibera. Um, so uh, the question we're putting is, how can we design effective, simple solutions to improve Nairobi's street experience? It's a huge, huge question. And basically, we're bringing it down to one point at this moment in time. Even though in the future we want to deal with easy and, and cost-effective ways of drainage and things like that, the first thing we want to do is understand how we can reintroduce indigenous trees within the street. Um, so those trees need to be suitable to the localized eleva elevations and soil types and meet the street requirements, you know, that they don't have huge roots because a lot of tropical trees are very vicious in how they look for water, so you have to be very careful what you choose. And most importantly is choosing trees of cultural significance. I just want to tell a little story. Um, when we were doing that courtyard, the junction courtyard, um, the, the big existing trees, there, there's a line of existing trees that are zygium, and they produce this amazing purple fruit. And when we were going on the initial site visit, we suddenly saw all these smarted, suited businessmen um, scurrying around the floor, picking up the fruit and eating them, and they became children again. And basically, Mike and I were talking to them and trying to understand, and they were telling us stories that these trees used to be in their villages. And so the idea that a tree can bring back a lot of memory was very, very interesting to us and is going to determine what species we choose to reintroduce within the street. Uh, this is just to look at historical images of Nairobi and to see where it all went wrong, which was during the colonial period with the British. 
they totally messed it up. Um, so you can see what they're planting is avenues of eucalyptus and grevillea, which are, they're, they're beautiful and fine and suited in Australia, but within Africa and within the rest of the world, they bring a lot of problems in degrading the soil and in taking up too much water, basically changing the, the localized environment. Um, so it all went wrong with the British. Um, this is just a map, just understanding the huge elevation changes that we're dealing with within Nairobi. Um, and the vegetation changes dramatically. In the lower plains, it's grassland scrub, acacia scrub. And then the higher up the elevation you go, um, we get amazing, amazing forest. Um, the other thing is looking at the soils, which are very, very distinct. Um, you have black cotton, which is an impossible <laughs> soil to build on. Um, and it's what most Nairobi is built on. Uh, and then we've got really beautiful, um, the red-brown clays, which are very deep forest soil. Um, and basically, the vegetation that you see, the natural vegetation, is directly reflective of where the soil starts, starts and stops. That's interesting. So this is the stage we're at. It's very, very simple. We're first studying typical sections. So the bottom is the typical Kibera section now. And then we're looking at the tree species which would have naturally have grown there. And our idea is in the future is to come up with a booklet and an indication of what tr tree species can be used as a reintroduction into those zones. So it's really just starting at the very top of all the layers of the problems that come within the streets, within the env urban environment within Africa. Um, now I want to talk about some of our conservation projects. Um, this is a project I think some of you maybe have seen. Where I love projects like this, where you have a natural environment that you have to intervene into. Um, this is Lewa Downs, it's an UNESCO World Heritage Site in northern Kenya. Um, and basically the brief from the client was, this is for a lodge, um, and basically the, the people who come and visit the lodge spend all day driving around seeing the animals, but they don't get up and close to the beauty of the grasslands, which are so incredibly unique. Um, so we were discussing with, with the owners and we were saying that um, in a way it'd be really interesting to provide a space where people could go and lie and be close um, and be able to enjoy the grasses, which is so incredibly beautiful. Um, and through this process of education, getting up close with the grasses, it basically draws attention to the fact that these grasslands are very, very, very fragile landscapes. Um, and with the sort of human pressures within Africa, they're becoming vastly depleted. Um, this is the plan of the section. You can see it's just very simple. It's just one simple intervention into a wider landscape. Um, a very soft hand, I guess. And it just provides enough, a place which is safe, because you are in Africa, and there's lots of puff ashes and things like that. So a place, place where people can lie and really enjoy and observe the, the wildlife close hand, the ants and the, the dudus you say in Swahili. Um, the different insects as well as the grasses. So yeah, it's a very quiet space. Um, I've just written an article about this project and, and the end of it was, I say, come and take a breath with me to just take time to see and appreciate. Um, as a direct roll-on effect to that, this is a very commercial project within Nairobi. We came in very late for this project and the engineers, I mean, it's a nightmare working in Africa, I'll just say that. But um, basically we came in and they said, we need a landscape, we need a solution. The, we only have 200 millimeters of soil you can work with. Uh, what are you gonna do? And so obviously because of the soil limitations, we can only work with very shallow rooted plants. And following on with, with my experience that these grasslands are becoming very heavily de depleted through overgrazing, our idea was to bring some of the grasslands into the Nairobi setting. So this is a, a roof garden that's planted with um, four different in indigenous grass species. Um, I've not got all the grass species there. The other thing which is really interesting is we're planting gloriosa lilies and aloes. Now these are two indigenous flowers that flower twice a year just before the rains. Um, and so the idea is, is that these grasslands, you're gonna have a sea of grass and twice a year, you're just gonna have these bursts of red. And for me, it's really important within Africa that people understand the sense of seasonability because we do have seasons even though we're on the equator and the seasons are dry and wet and the vegetation changes dramatically. Um, so it's really bringing that close to the people in the city so they don't forget their heritage, which is remarkable. Um, 
This is a really amazing project. This is for the African Wildlife Foundation um, in a very, very, very remote part of Uganda. It's basically for the Kadepo National Park, so it's northern Uganda and Sudan. The, the park is shared between Sudan and Uganda. Um, I just want to show you, because this is very typical of the landscape, um, it's a savanna grassland and scrub, and then you have these huge um, granite copies, so it's very, very beautiful. Um, this just shows you exactly where it is on the map. It's basically half in Sudan, half in, in Uganda. And this is a, a, a photograph of the park flying in. It's so remote, this project, we have to fly in a little aeroplane, so it's fun. Um, just to show you the, the beauty of the landscape, it really is remarkable. Um, sorry, this image is really bad because I took it from my phone when we climbed. You know the first image I show you with a copy? We climbed that rock with the architect to really understand our wider landscape. And so this was taken from above. But this shows you the traditional Karamajong homesteads, which is fascinating and had a direct effect on, on our design. You can see they're all, the villages are always built around a central tree. Often it's a mango tree. Um, and then you've got these fences, which are basically hardwood branches that are woven in together, basically to stop the lion. I mean, you're right in the middle of, of effectively a national park. So you need to protect yourself basically against the lion because they have a few livestock. It's not a lot, but they have a few. And so obviously the lion are going to come. So it's, it's fascinating, very interesting and very inspiring to see how they build their houses. Um, this is again just to show you, you see how they weave the, the fences, it's fascinating. Now our client, the African Wildlife Foundation, have actually made these fences illegal because obviously from an environmental point of view, it's really bad because they go and cut down a lot of the bush. Um, so they're making these fences illegal, but you can't get away from the people that they need this sense of protection. It's very, very important. So this was very important for me to find a way of still maintaining this idea that you have a big fence. Uh, this is a plan for one of the schools where you can see it's sort of this billowing effect with the central tree. I just want to point out the football pitch looks like it's very formal, but it's not at all. It's just going to be slash grass and you won't see it like that. I meant to change it, but I didn't have time. But this is really for the clients to tick their box that they're doing the football pitch. Um, now, one thing that uh, this sort of billowing idea You've got a series of sort of walls that are protecting it, as well as a hedge, which you'll see. Um, and what we're using is, is um, we're using the local granite that's sourced right there. It's very sustainable because it's just a local karamajong uh, going with pickaxes and just choosing isolated areas to harvest the stone. So the architectural element, they're also, we're also using stone because we got really excited about the stone. And this is one of the, one of the benches um, which we're building underneath one of these fig trees um, in construction. So it's, this is just a foundation element of the, of the dry stone wall. Um, this is really interesting. This is um, Euphorbia candelabria, which is uh, basically the cactus tree. Uh, they grow very beautiful and they, they grow right there. So this was our idea. It's basically, we're creating fences with the Euphorbia candelabra. Um, and what I love about this is it's very sustainable, it's sourcing the cuttings, and straight away we get a fence which is a meter high. So um, this is the cuttings, They've, you basically cut them off the tree and then you have to let them sit for two weeks for the ends to seal, otherwise they rot. So it's nice we're creating their woven fence still. <laughs> uh, this is a project you'll know. <laughs> this is um, Salam House. This is a residential project in the coast. Um, and it's quite important to understand that um, the coast in Kenya has really beautiful um, bush and forest, and it's being totally destroyed as people plant green lawns and palm trees in their tropical gardens, their hibiscus. Um, and what was really nice as a client is it's very nice, and we've worked with them for a long time. Um, and they, we really were in discussions with them in, in the importance of trying to preserve the indigenous bush, because it has so many species which are so remarkable, and they're being destroyed. So there really was a strong element of conservation here. Um, some of our interventions are very simple. It's just a simple path moving through. It's nothing to shout home about. Um, this, I just want to show you the bush and the dry, because again, the seasonability here is really, really important. Um, when it's in the rainy season, it's very, very thick, and then in the dry, it totally drops its leaves, and it's like a skeleton. So um, it's quite interesting. Yeah, so, and then we did these simple interventions. Well, I think you've seen where we had these much wider paths so you can walk comfortably through the bush. 
Um, don't forget, it's very hot, it's very humid. You have plants like this Stankfox xylem, which is just remarkable. So it's got this sort of thorny um, trunk. Um, yeah, so basically these simple paths which allow you to be able to walk easily through the landscape. Um, I just want to show you some of the species in the rains, how remarkable the plants are and why they should be preserved and why you shouldn't plant hibiscus, which I hate. Um, <laughs> this is a wild jasmine, it's incredible and it grows a lot. It sort of scrambles up all through the bush. This, we still haven't found what the name is, but this is a creeper that produces these amazing umbels. I mean, it's remarkable. This is, um, this is in the caper family, which is quite interesting. They call it the bush banana or something. It produces fruit that you can eat, very similar to a caper. But it's, it's remarkable, it's beautiful. So yeah, I mean, all, this is the main reason why we need to preserve the bush, and we just did these very simple gestures which allow you to experience it. Um, but look at the Xanthox xylem, they're so amazing, <laughs> their trunks, they're so beautiful. Um, this is a nice element of it. This was an old stone fountain which was carved back in the 50s in Nairobi, and it was, belonged to the client in their Nairobi house, and we decided that it belonged in the simplicity of Selam House, and so it all comes apart, but it was very complicated and very hard to bring it. The road from Nairobi to the coast is long and rough, and so we were amazed that it actually made it, but yeah, this is it. Now, being installed in its new home, it's not finished yet in this photo. Um, we do a lot of agricultural and educational projects, not so much in Kenya, uh, but in Uganda and Rwanda. We do a lot. Um, this is a really interesting project, mainly because of its budget. Um, this is for the Cotton On Foundation. We're doing seven schools in total. Um, and our budget for this garden was $2,000. So we had to find a way of creating spaces for the children, um, planting orchards, which are going to be nutritious fruit trees for the children, basically with no money. Um, so we had to find, we basically used very, very local stone that we found just in the valley, um, built this simple, very simple sort of amphitheater idea where the children can gather, but they can also balance and play. Um, again, the past, we couldn't afford cement, so it's just stone paths that are laid within the soil. Um, you can kind of see there we've got, the design has got a big grid of, of orchards in it, but the trees are literally this big. Um, and then what's really nice is these spaces between the classrooms is basically looking at the negative space between the architecture and understanding how can we activate those spaces. So we're, together with the architect, we made it an outdoor classroom. And the surface is just sand, so it's, it's soft. One thing you have to remember with these schools is, is the parents are working, it's an agricultural part of Uganda, the parents are working in their fields, and the, the young school children often have to take their baby brothers and sisters to school with them. It's, it's quite remarkable. And so the idea is that whilst they're playing, there's sort of a soft surface for their brothers and sisters to play on, rather than being thrown on, on a rock or something. Um, of course, this is very much in its early stages, and the trees have not grown yet. This is supposed to be a shaded classroom. Um, it's just a detail I think is actually really beautiful to show you the stone edging and the sand classroom, just simple. It's a really nice project we're doing in, again, in southern Uganda, in Rakai, and it's one of my favorite projects because it's so remarkable. It's a monastery for Cistercian monks, and it's fascinating for a few different reasons. Um, the traditional architecture and landscape within Cistercian monasteries is fascinating. Like, for example, the main church has to be uh, 12 meters high, 15 meters long, and seven meters wide, so it's a fascinating dimension. Um, and then in regards to the landscape, um, Cistercian monks always sort of build on very bad land, so obviously, usually it's sort of swamps, so drainage plays a huge part of it, so drainage played a huge part within our design. This is just one simple courtyard um, in front of the church. We've just got a reflective body of water because don't forget we're in Uganda and there are lakes everywhere. So huge expanses of water basically summarize Uganda. That is what Uganda is. So I, we wanted just a simple body of water to reflect the facade of the church. And also really interestingly, the main monk said to me, you know, we really, we want to be closed to the outside world. We just want to be within ourselves and contemplate. But he said, within this day and age, we can't be a monastery in the middle of Africa and not open our doors. Um, so he said, we have to seem open, but the reality is, is we don't want to be. 
And I felt this was really interesting to put a physical barrier between their sort of contemplative space, which is the church, and the outside. So this is sort of this side is the entrance as you go into the monastery. So there's a physical barrier that people can't actually reach their church. Um, so this is a plan. We're doing four courtyards um, up. Up there, that's the main cloister. Then we've got the visitor's courtyard. This is the main courtyard I just show you there. And then this is the novitiate courtyard for the training monks. Um, I'll just show you a few renders quickly. This is our courtyard designed for the novitiate monks. Um, what I find really interesting is traditionally cloisters are supposed to be a garden that you're supposed to observe from the outside. You're not supposed to go into the garden. Um, and it was really funny. Our original design for the main cloister um, had it full, it was a plantation of a coconut plantation because orchards are very important for monks. Um, but the monks said, No, 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 we, we, we need it grass because we need to have events in our spaces, which I found very funny. But um, this is an officiate courtyard, so the idea here we're using local granite, um, hand dress, and the idea it's a very pale grey. So the idea in the middle of the day, don't forget you're in the tropics, the sun is very blinding. So the reflection of this space will be too bright in the middle of the day, but in the Early evening and morning, it's going to calm down. It's going to be very gentle, so the monks going to be able to enter into the space. So really thinking, what materials can we use to sort of, I don't know, encourage the way the space is used, I guess. This is the visitor's courtyard, the only place where children might potentially come. We've got a very simple design where it's traditionally divided up into quarters, and we're really playing with the drainage here. We've do we're designing these stone drainage channels, and I really imagine like children coming and sort of walking along the line and maybe it's simple. <laughs> this is a really nice project. I'm really sad Mike's not here to talk about this project because it's his favorite project. And again, want to show you what we do with literally no budget. Um, this is a school for mentally and physically disabled children in um, just outside Nairobi. Um, one thing you need to be very aware of if, is disabled children within Kenya are often considered a curse, and they're really, literally, like locked under cupboards. I mean, it's it's really awful what happens. So um, this is school for for them, and there's a little physiotherapy department to help them. And basically, we came in and just did very simple interventions. Um, like, for example, planting these Marcamia lutea very close together, so you have a sense of repetition, which is very, very calming um, for children in general, but also children with disabilities. Um, you see, yeah, it's, really, it's really wonderful seeing how the children interact within this space. They you know, run up and down, it's very nice. The other thing which is really important is just doing a simple series of paths um, so the children can get from A to B. It's very simple, but it's transformed their lives. It's amazing, especially the children um, who are in wheelchairs. And we just planted avenues of Marcamia either side. You can see this is, um, this is a second phase, so you can see the trees are much lower. Um, but the idea is there's just going to be a shaded path, and that's it, but it's transformed their lives. It's a really nice project. Here's another project we're doing for the uh, Iowa State University in, in Uganda. This project is very simple. I just wanted to show you um, how difficult it is to work in Africa. It reminds me of what you were talking about working in Russia, where you have to do absolutely everything. We have to detail everything. We have to go to the quarries. We have to grow the trees by seed. And these, these are bohemia, and we collected the seed on site from trees already on site. And we grew them for a year and a half as the project was being constructed. And this is them now, the courtyard trees. So it's quite nice. It is very simple spaces. Uh, this is an agricultural college, so this is the agricultural demonstration zone. Um, it's quite nice, the different tropical crops. This is amaranth. You can see, look how high that amaranth is, it's amazing. And sweet potato and things like that. Just demonstration garden. Um, I put this image in to show you how amazing the different species that we're dealing with. Um, this is a jackfruit tree. You see those funny, like, fruits? They grow really big, like this big. Um, it's a very strange tasting fruit. Um, now, yeah, these are some of our residential projects, which I think are important. Yeah, um, just really quickly. So this is just to show you that um, we really explore and we have to go to the route to find any materials that we're going to use. This is a project in the Masai Mara, and this is us going to the local quarries to understand how the project's going to develop. It's this beautiful red stone. You can see the strata of the quarry. This really was part of our inspiration and in how we developed the project. 
Again, our interventions are very simple. We're not trying to be too clever. We're just doing a path from, to lead people to the front door of the house. Um, so this is the path in construction. You see this is the path leading round, and you see how we've worked the stone. We're really sort of drawing, drawing directionally um, the direction to lead you to the front door. Anyway, two different gestures. <laughs> this is the stone just in colour, so you can see the detail. And this is really fun. This is a drainage detail, so we've got a drain underneath so the water comes through. Uh, just really quickly, this is another project. I just want to talk about really quickly the difficulties of working within Africa. Um, these are stone cobbles, which you see everywhere in Hamburg. But here, the, we had to go to the quarry again, we had to pick the stone, we had to hand dress them on site, and then lay the cobbles. So um, it took us six months in total to prepare the stone. It's a very simple gun. The, the house is sunk, and we had to do these retaining elements. Um, this is the stair, the other side, the cobbles. I just see simple elements. The line in the center is a French drain underneath. Um, so you can just see how that line then, then moves up onto the cantilever stairs. Just little gestures. Now this is Salam House. This is the same house as the same project as the one with the past, but this is around the house where we developed a garden, but using agricultural plants. Um, so using a lot of bananas. This is an entrance courtyard. Again, we, um, there's a concrete water tank underneath here, so you only have 200 millimeters of soil to work with. So um, yeah, the bananas are doing really well. <laughs> so these are the species we're using a lot in, around the house, the papaya and the banana. Just to show you around the house, it's this, and then yeah, as you go into the bush, it's a simple pass. And then just quickly to finish, um, we do a lot of custom pieces because we get excited about different things. These are some pots we did with some guys just on the side of the road. It was really fun. Um, you can see that's their wheel, their potter's wheel at the back, which is just the hub of a wheel. Um, so yeah, this is some designs we did, which is fun. Sorry, the quality of this is not so good, but these are some light bollards that we did for the garden with the cobbles, the courtyard garden. Um, this is really amazing, soapstone. I don't know if you know soapstone, it's a stone that people carve little elephants and little trinkets out of, often eggs. But soapstone comes from, a lot of it comes from Kenya. It doesn't, it's only found in very few areas of the world and it's a very dense stone. It really feels like soap, it's amazing. It's what talcum powder is made from really interesting. And the stone, when it comes out of the quarry, is this beautiful sort of russet red. And basically, this, the, we did these pieces for an intervention into a garden um, as lighting bollards. So we just made simple cuts within the stone to expose the pure white interior. And then we've set them into the garden. We've just reflected light off the white. So it's a very nice way of... Uh, they're just, it's just really a really beautiful and unique material and unique to Kenya. So. It's just very simple. This is just a bench we did as a, as a memorial, um, just using local stone found on site. Just a dry stack wall that we built ourselves. Like, <laughs> and this is the last thing, just again, just to show you some of the exterior lighting that we developed, just because it's fun. So this is our exterior lamp, which is made out of, of solid brass and, and a clay sort of fez hat on top. Um, <laughs> 